Hello everyone, welcome to the first of our live broadcasts where we're going to answer some of the questions that you've been posting on the Falls website. I'm joined here with Professor Julia Newton. Hello. Who we've met in our Meet the Experts series and Dr Chris Elliott who we've also met in the Meet the Experts series, both of whom have been mentors on the course and you may have met through the discussions on there. Chris is an occupational therapist. Morning. And Julia is a professor of ageing, but also a consultant physician. We've had a lot of questions that people have posted, and we're going to try and answer as many as we can. There's a few questions on there that are quite personal, and I'm really sorry we can't answer personal questions, but if you try and take away some of the general principles, I hope they'll be able to help you. So let's start with the first question, which I think is a really good one. And this one comes from Mick. Is there a good way to fall? Have you got any answers for that? Well, I, th I think um, what we find in clinic is that um, people will either crumble to the ground or will actually fall down like a bag of potatoes almost. And the people who tend to fall very heavily um, tend to be less likely to put their hands out to save themselves and break their fall. Whereas the people who crumble to the floor um, are more able often to stop themselves or hold on to things. So if you get chance to think through the process of falling as it's happening, trying to fall gently to the ground rather than banging down, I think is much less likely to cause you to have injuries. Actually, one of the comments from one of the men we've got on the course was that he was in the army and as part of his tra training he was taught to fall safely and he said that that stood him in good stead. As he's got older, he knows how to fall safely. Yeah. The, the way to do it is exactly the same way that people are taught either when they're practicing a parachute jump or is it judo or one of the yeah, martial arts? Yeah, some of the martial arts, isn't it? Um, Aikido, um, I know, uh, teaches you how to roll and fall. Yeah, and, and it's about breaking the fall on the way mm. down. So try to land on your knees first, then the hips and then the shoulders. But actually, people have looked at this before. They've trained people in, in the gym with crash mats to try and prevent falls related injuries. And what it showed that people in the gym can prevent injuries, falling safely on the crash mat. But once they're in the big open world, a fall hits you in an unpredictable manner mm. and there isn't time to put the knowledge into place. Yeah. And so actually training people doesn't work in real life. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it depends how long you've got, doesn't it? If you start to totter and you begin to realise you're about to fall, you perhaps can take some avertive action to make yourself fall in a safer way. But often particularly people who have blackouts that might lead to them having a fall, it's often that they just bang to the ground. Yeah. And that, that, you would imagine, is more likely to be associated with injury. Yeah. In fact, next week we'll be looking at some of the injuries that happen that give us clues that it might have been a blackout rather than yeah. a fall. Yeah. Right, so let's have a look at our next question, which is another useful one but for people who know people that fall. So. What advice would we give to people who care for people who fall? Chris, have you got any advice for carers? It's, um, it's an interesting one when it comes to um, people who are caring um, because we also wouldn't want them to feel responsible once somebody has had a fall. But we know from a lot of the work we've been doing this week, particularly on the course, um, when it comes to preventing falls and looking at risk factors, um, so making sure that you've covered all of those issues that we've been talking about, all those simple things that you can do in, in the home or for that person you're caring about. But also one of the things is we wouldn't recommend that people try and catch people who are falling. That was something I was going to ask. Um, because of course you, you're then putting yourself um, at risk of injury and depending on how that person falls, you don't know that your weight adding to their weight is going to cause greater injury mm. um, through the impact. So, um, so what we'd say is, Try not to catch people if they're falling, but if they have fallen, um, you can look at different ways that you might help them at that point. We've covered some of those uh, things again this week, haven't we, about looking at how to help somebody up if they've fallen. But sometimes it's about reassurance, it's about calming the situation, it's about making sure they're all right and feeling all right. But again, what we would always suggest is look at those preventative measures. Yeah. 
So maybe um, someone who cares for someone who falls can maybe notice where the falls are happening. Absolutely. And again, this takes us back to some of those ideas around diaries. Um, and it's about being aware of where that person's falling, what, what are some triggers around that. And it could be um, environmental issues. It could be time of day. It could be, um, yeah, where and how and in what way. So keep that uh, record and then you can present that to the, to the health professional you're working with to maybe give them better clues. Which is important, I think, when we see people in clinic. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a witness statement is really helpful to us in clinic. You know, somebody who can describe what somebody looked like before and during the fall and also what they look like after the fall. So those can give us clues whether somebody has fallen, whether there's been a drop in their blood pressure, whether there's a problem with the way they walk, which might put them at risk of fall. So that, that's really interesting. And, and the way I try and think about falls in clinic when I see people is um, there are things about them that might put them at risk of falls, so um, physiological things, or things about their, their environment, so intrinsic and extrinsic things. And the things that in their environment are very much things that carers can help with trying to identify those risk factors that might put somebody at risk of Absolutely. having a fall. Absolutely. I think that's one of the most important uh, things you can do for somebody that you're caring for, eliminating some of those risks that we've highlighted and um, to take, take them out of the equation. Mm -hmm. The next question that we have is um, relating to people who have dementia. So are people with dementia more likely to fall? I think I can start answering this question. It depends which research study you look at. So mm -hmm. we know roughly that people with dementia or cognitive impairment are twice as likely to fall, but actually they're seven times more likely to have recurrent falls. And that's one of the th features of dementia. It happens quite regularly. Mm -hmm. From a practical point of view, is there anything different that we can do for people with cognitive impairment or dementia? Well, it's really difficult when people have problems with their memory um, because a lot of the strategies that we use in the clinic to um, help people recognise their falls risks and modify those risks are dependent upon people being able to recognise that they have a risk and remember what we have mm -hmm. asked them to do um, to mitigate those risks. So people with dementia are, are sometimes more difficult for us to, to help with in terms of risk factor identification. And that's where carers come in mm. because they're really important in helping us. And often they will be able to give us the history of what's been ha happening, you know, what people look like, the circumstances that falls happened in, which will be able to guide us in a way that patients with dementia sometimes can't help us in the clinic quite as much as people who have um, who have their full mental capacity. Um, so it, it, it is more difficult. It's much more of a detective story with people with dementia who have fallen. And often we have to put in um, strategies that um, are around people helping with their observations who aren't actually the patient themselves. I guess another important aspect is that um, some people receive tablets for their dementia and a common uh, or a not uncommon side effect of those tablets can be to slow the heart rate down or drop the blood pressure mm -hmm. and that would need looking into and people need to tell their doctors if they're falling and they're on tablets for dementia. Yeah. The other um, um, aspect of memory is something called delirium, which is an acute deterioration in memory when people become suddenly confused, usually because they have um, an illness like a urinary tract infection or a chest infection. And people can go from uh, being uh, very um, independent to suddenly being confused and disorientated. And um, we know that people with delirium are much more likely to fall because they uh, uh, can wander and be disorientated. And it's really important if people have a what we call an intercurrent illness, that they seek medical help very quickly, whether that be antibiotics or changing their tablets, um, to reduce that delirium and, and subsequently the associated risk of falls. Okay. Next. Uh, we have a question about 
exercise and this comes from Yolanda. Her question is specifically how exercise can help her knee and hip arthritis. I would just like to tell people that in week four of the course we'll be focusing on exercise, how different exercises can help people who fall and um, which ones might be better than others. So I want to save some of our answers about exercise for week four so we don't give everything away. Um, but also in week four when we do our second live session we'll have a physiotherapist here who can answer some of these questions. But I think we could probably try and answer this question um, about exercises to help the knee and hip in a very general, Absol yeah, general absolutely. way. Absolutely. So w we describe the exercises um, that we recommend to people in the clinic as lower limb strengthening exercises. So the intention of those is you know, the name, it, it's, it's not rocket science, is to strengthen the muscles around your hip and knee, so in your lower limbs, so that if um, you have any other risk factors um, that might put you at risk of falls, that your um, legs are strong enough to keep you upright and are less likely to cause you to tumble to the floor. So um, any exercises that improve hip, knee strength and muscle function or muscle bulk uh, are of benefit to you in terms of falls reduction. Yeah, I think stairs, going up and down the stairs keeps knees and hips active and sitting up and standing down from a chair. Yeah. These are just general mm. principles, but we will go into more detail in week four. Absolutely, but to note for now, we'll save those questions for our physio, um, keep active. Yeah, that, that, would be, that would be our key message from today. We'll, we'll go into more detail as the course continues, but that is the key message. Keep active. This is another question which comes up a lot in clinic and has been um, uh, posted on the, online as well about the link between hearing, the inner ear and balance. Mm -hmm. So we, we saw in week one um, the video of how we use our senses to maintain our balance, but hearing isn't one of those senses. And the part of the ear which deals with hearing is the middle ear, and the part which deals with balance is the inner ear. They're very close together within the head and the brain, and in some aspects they are connected with the nerves and the blood supply, but hearing isn't really involved in balance. Yeah, so you can you can have problems with your hearing, but not be at risk of falls. Yeah. So, um, so although it's all very closely related in a very small area of your brain, your inner inner ear and middle ear, in actual fact, um, people who have deafness are not necessarily at increased risk of falls. Mm -hmm. This one is related to blood pressure. And this one comes from Rosalind. I think her question was related to being in a hospital ward and the nurses were worried because when she stood up, her blood pressure dropped. Okay. But when she stood up, she didn't feel dizzy ah. or she didn't have any um, recognition that her blood pressure was dropping. And she was wondering, how can people know if their blood pressure is dropping when they stand up? Because it's a major cause of falls. Yeah, it's a really good question that Rosalind um, uh, raises. Uh, and it's really common and um, we know that um, people who drop their blood pressure are often very dizzy and lightheaded when they stand up and in hospital um, we can frequently recognize low blood pressure or drops in blood pressure when people stand up and we know that those are associated with falls um, if people are symptomatic and it, it is often very difficult to uh, recognize what those symptoms might be and it's usually um, a feeling of lightheadedness, dizziness, particularly when you stand up, dizziness after food, so large meals where blood goes to your gut to digest those meals. And the other main symptom that I've got a particular interest in is fatigue, so where people aren't getting enough blood to their heart, their brain, their muscles, um, that we believe manifests as the symptom of fatigue and tiredness. So those are symptoms to look for and um, perhaps have your blood pressure measured. Um, and interestingly, um, particularly in the UK, we often see patients in clinic who have um, been reassured that their blood pressure is very low and that that's a healthy thing. And in a lot of respects, it is healthy, but people um, often forget that low blood pressure, you know, blood pressure is like the head of steam that gets the blood around your body. And if that's not high enough, 
that can actually cause problems. So low blood pressure is not necessarily a good thing for people. In countries like Germany and, and in some areas of the US, low blood pressure is recognised as being a pathological thing, um, but it's, it's less so here. It'd be interesting perhaps from the discussion boards for people to add um, their perception of what low blood pressure, how it's perceived by doctors in their country, because it is very variable. And in countries like Germany, they have clinics that manage low blood pressure, whereas in the UK, we don't have things like that. And something that we notice is that it can happen a lot overnight, people getting up to go to the loo. Um, how, what general measures can people take if they need to get up during the night to go to the loo to avoid their blood pressure dropping? Well, I think one of the key things is, of course, to take your time. Um, I, I understand that you've just woken up and you might be used to being in a pattern and you might have a routine through the night of getting up and, and going to the bathroom. But take your time, sit up and just wait. Wait until you feel steady. In addition, we would like to make sure that everyone's using the correct lighting and having a light in the hallway. I know that that's, that's a separate issue from the blood pressure, but these are, these are other risk elements. But when you sit up, take your time. Don't sit up, stand up, and then, you know, run the risk of falling. Yeah, there's a, uh, the, there is also a tendency for gentlemen yeah. to insist, because they've done it all their life, that when they're urinating, that they stand to do that. And often um, we get people who come into the clinic with what we call micturition syncope, which is people who black out when they're having a pee. And um, we would recommend in those circumstances that gentlemen try and change their behaviour and um, sit down um, because that makes their blood pressure much less likely to drop. Yeah. And blood pressure naturally is lower at night time, Absolutely. so it's a much bigger risk mm -hmm. getting yeah. up during yeah. the night. Yeah. Someone once gave me, um, I went to a teaching session, um, it was all about um, toileting and incontinence, and it's really common that people wake up in the night, they think they need a wee, and so they go because they're worried that they might leak or wet the bed. Um, and one tip that she gives people is, don't get up, count backwards from 50 or count to 100, and you'll find that you'll just go back to sleep by the time you get to 50 and you didn't, you didn't need to get up because your bladder's big enough. Yeah. This is it, isn't it? It's, it's, sometimes it's about breaking those routines. Yeah. You, the fact that you've done it for years doesn't mean that you can't actually uh, change you know, your nighttime behaviours. Mm -hmm. So what's our next question? This one comes from Jane. How does exercise and fitness prevent falls? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> and it's about those lo lower limbs. So I, I like to describe it. I think I put something on the discussion board this week. As, um, if I'm on a bus and the bus jolts, um, my muscles are strong enough um, to avoid me tipping over as a result of that jolting of the bus. And if we um, sort of use the jolting of the bus as being any additional risk factor um, for why somebody might fall, like blood pressure dropping or taking tablets, um, that actually, if I have something happen to me physically, like my blood pressure dropping, akin to the bus jolting, if my um, muscles are strong enough, they will keep me upright. So that's why having stronger legs, um, and particularly the big muscles around the tops of your legs, um, your, your gluteus maximus type muscles, um, stronger, then that means that you're much less likely to hit the deck if something happens, um, some additional risk factor bus jolting or blood pressure dropping. I think me and Chris were both wondering there, when was the last time Professor Newton was on a bus? <laughs> <laughs> I use the bus very regularly. <laughs> the other way that exercise can help prevent falls is by stimulating the nerves in, in the feet. So in, in week one we learn how our brain relies on information from our lower limbs to know where they are, what they're doing, and also send signals back to tell them how to respond and exercise and activity keeps these nerves active and healthy. Mm -hmm. It also helps um, prevent memory loss. Right. So it yes, absolutely. Yeah. Exercise is good for all sorts of reasons, yeah. not just falls prevention. Yeah. Sometimes we have to be careful with the use, use of the word exercise, though. Yeah, that's true. The yeah. um, older people particularly, or people who have been inactive for a long period of time, the concept of exercise is very alien to people. And um, sometimes they think when we recommend exercise that we mean for them to start 
going to the gym or running a marathon. And actually what we generally mean is increasing your activity. Absolutely. Um, so perhaps going up and down the stairs um, more often. So very low levels of activity at the beginning mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you're going to fail at that. So if I say to people, um, you need to go to the gym every day or you need to swim every day, that's going to be a, a huge behaviour change. Whereas if we set reasonable goals for increased activity, like swimming once a week or going to a gym once a week and doing low levels of activity, that's more realistic and achievable for somebody. And of course, it might not even be at that stage. I know we've had some questions in um, about older, frailer um, people and, and how do we get those people who have been inactive. And it is about activity and you're right about setting goals. And for example, an occupational therapist would look at a long-term goal and that long-term goal might be getting to a, to a swimming pool in particular yeah. where there would be an appropriate aqua class. But we would set in gentle steps along the way simply to get people moving again and we'll be using a day-to-day -day activity to get that process going. Um, and, and that's the key again, it's about activity and it's about being um, physically active wherever you can, yeah. building up gradually. Okay, who have we got next? So Heather and Linda have posted a question about how do you weigh up um, the risks of being active, keeping your activity up to prevent falls, but not increasing your risk of having a fall? And well, that's a very, really good question and very difficult to answer because um, there are considerable health benefits from being more active. But Heather and Linda are absolutely right. Um, uh, there have been studies done in patients with Parkinson's disease where actually making people um, or encouraging people to be more active and more mobile as a consequence has actually increased the fall rates. So it is a very difficult balance and it's about a whole package of falls risk reduction um, together with increasing people's general activity levels um, for the considerable health benefits that that will bring. Yeah. It takes us back to that idea of of gradually increasing activity up to a point of exercise where appropriate. Yeah, yeah. and because we, we can't know what everybody is yeah. capable of and what they can do and how much risk there will be in certain situations. So it has to be sort of a joint decision with a lot of the decision making being up to the person themselves about what they're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, being realistic about yeah. the situation. I think this one, next one might be for you, Chris. For someone at risk of having falls in the shower, it is a risky place with mm -hmm. it being slippery mm -hmm. on the bottom or with it being hot and causing people to faint. Is it safer to have a sliding door or a push-pull door? Or a pivoting door. Good question. Yes, <laughs> thanks, thanks very much for this question. Um, so I actually took some additional advice on this question. Um, because what we don't want is to create fear for those who sit in each camp yeah. of the sliding door to the pivot door. Um, and there are, of course, when you think about it and debate this question, there are pros and cons. However, the advice I was um, given is that a sliding door is a safer uh, mechanism. One, because um, uh, when this question was posted, it was a very uh, good comment. If you fall against the pivot door, it can go. Um, but pivot doors are also known um, because of the mechanism that they sit on to have a greater risk of shattering, mm -hmm. um, which, as I say, uh, was the advice I, you know, I was given. So the sliding door, if, if you are to, to fall, it does at least give you something to break the fall, as we were discussing earlier, and, and, and slightly more time. Um, obviously, what we would recommend, where possible, would be um, a wet shower or a wet room where there isn't a shower tray, where you're not stepping in and out, where you're reducing those risks. Where that isn't possible, the sliding door was thought to be a better option merely because you can't fall against it and open it and topple straight out the bath. Um, but again, it's a very difficult one to answer and it's you would have to look at it with that person in that environment and see how frail they are, how active yeah. they are, how able they are. And but a very, very good question and, and one that might be interesting for further discussion. Would um, putting a stool in the shower 
Be helpful, or would it increase the risk of falling? And, and again, the, it still can be really, really, really useful, and it is something that we prescribe a lot. It's a very simple thing that can have people um, sitting, um, which means that they're, they're reducing their, um, you know, standing up time or slipping time. But you can't just put any stool in any shower. Yeah. There are regulations around it because not all trays are suitable, not all spaces are wide enough. Okay. Um, the, the, the most important thing that you can do is to put handrails and grab rails in and around your bathroom. That would be my, rather than worry about the screen doors and what the different things are, I would recommend, be, before you start changing shower screens, what I would recommend is that you think about putting some additional handrails in that would, can just steady you and help you as you turn in the shower to okay. just keep yourself a little mm. more stable. Okay. Next one, um, I think it should be a fairly quick one to answer. I'll take this one. It's how can I reduce my fear of falling on ice? And it's quite pertinent to me. I think it was yesterday we had um, a bad frost and, uh -huh. it, and I was walking to work across the town moor and it was really slippy and I changed the way I walked, taking slow, um, small, cautious steps and I was worried about slipping and s everybody <laughs> is worried about slipping on ice and mm -hmm. it is a really common cause of fear of falling. But someone's done a trial of those devices that you can put on the... Tracker. Grips. Yeah, grip, yeah, the grips yeah. that attach onto your footwear. And a lot of people have mentioned those yeah, on there's the, been a lot uh, of the discussion great boards. discussion and yeah. advice mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. those. And they, um, they've been proven to prevent falls in snow and ice. But I think someone did post a really useful comment about um, take them off before you're going in on your new carpets in your <laughs> new liner because they can put holes yeah, in. Yeah. Your wood, nice, lovely in, wood floor. Yeah. It'll put divot holes in yeah. there. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next question, uh, uh, this one cropped up a few times, was about arthritis and joint replacements. How, why is, why is there a, does it seem to be that falls are more common in people with joint replacements? My impression is that our brain relies on signals from our joints to keep our balance. If you replace the joint, you've taken away the nerve from the joint and the body has to rebuild those nerves and retrain its balance with a new joint. Yeah, and, and also it changes the way you walk. Yeah. So it, as well as changing your balance, it changes what we call your gait. So you have to learn a, a whole new way of walking. You know, in some people, it will change their posture, so their centre of gravity may change, and as a result, it, it, it is more likely to make you um, fall if, if you have some additional risk factor associated with that. Mm -hmm. Oh no, the next question. <laughs> uh, this, this question has uh, really exploded on, on the course and it's the question of being on four or more medications. And this comment comes from someone who says they can't help feeling dissatisfied with the statement that being on four medications increases the chance of falling is for the magic number. The first thing I want to say is, if you are on four or more medications, you are at an increased risk of falling, but the answer is not to cut the med medication down to being on less than four. The answer is, it helps us recognise who is at risk, mm -hmm. and it helps us know who we need to help. Yeah, so it's all about a package of risk reduction. So targeting one particular um, risk we know is ineffective at reducing um, falls risk. It's about addressing multiple risk factors. So this is one thing that we know in a multifactorial intervention um, will um, identify those who are at increased risk of falls and who we need to therefore target for things like environmental assessment, um, lower limb strengthening exercises, etc. And it also helps us identify the group of patients who are perhaps more likely to drop their blood pressure or slow their heart rate. So it's, you know, I like to think about medicine as a detective story and you follow the clues. And this is one of the clues that points us towards individuals who are at risk of falls and as you go down your sort of pathway um, looking at the clues you might then decide to do a test 
and that test will then send you off along another path. And this is just one of the things that we look for in the clinic, that there is good evidence in the scientific literature that this is a trigger that allows us to recognise those that are at increased risk of falls. The studies have been done, big studies um, that have been replicated in the scientific literature, confirming that four does seem to be the magic number. Um, somebody on the um, discussion boards has said, does that mean that eight is double the risk? No, that's not what the studies have shown. Four is the magic number. And if we review people's medicine and um, reduce the medicines that appear to be inappropriate, then that is recognised as reducing the risk of falls. So it is something that as part of the whole package we look at in people. So it's important that we recognise it. Um, but as James says, in the vast majority of people, they're on those medicines for another reason. And therefore, it's important that any changes are made in discussion with your doctor. Yeah. And like I said, the aim isn't to go on less than four. The aim is just to have them reviewed because so often people don't need the medication they were on a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, I spend my life um, taking people off medicines, which is very satisfying in the Falls Clinic. So people who perhaps had a heart attack at 50 or had angina at 60 or were diagnosed with high blood pressure at 70 are now 90 and physiologically they've changed completely. And we know as we get older, the way we metabolize drugs, the way we absorb drugs is very different. So it may be that drugs are not as necessary as they were when we were younger. And as a result, we don't need them when we get to 80 or 90. Okay. Another contentious issue, <laughs> one after the other, was very focal lenses. I don't know quite know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, actually, we um, I've put a blog on the um, on the on the website and in an email that um, will be sent out today. People will get a link to the blog where they can read a bit more about why very focals might cause falls. But it's all to do with the bottom half of the glasses like being for reading. Mm -hmm. So if you're about to approach a set of stairs, you're looking through the bottom part of the glasses which is for near distance and it changes depth perception. Mm -hmm. So for those people who are fans of very focal lenses, we're not saying you have to stop using them, but they do increase your risk of falls. And the situations where that will be worse is outdoors and going down the stairs. But it's a personal decision. Yeah. We can make recommendations mm -hmm. and you can ignore them or adopt them. It's up to you. Yeah, and I think it's about what suits you as an individual. It's part of that package that we address when we see people in the falls clinic. How can we reduce your risk of having a, another fall? And um, varifocals are recognised as being a risk factor for falls. We will recommend to people that they should consider changing their um, glasses. Um, and it's up to an individual whether they choose to take that recommendation or say, actually, my varifocals are fine for me. Yeah, some people seem to manage really well with them. Absolutely. But some people can't get on with them and yeah. use two separate pairs. Yeah, or three or four pairs yeah. if you're my mother. <laughs> uh, this is a question that actually we will be discussing in week four, but someone's asked it now, so we can probably start to broach the question, hip protectors. What are they? Uh, uh, hip protectors <laughs> are like um, super pants <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they are um, quite unattractive um, so they look like um, like recycling mm -hmm. shorts with um, big cushions on um, the edges um, which are the areas that um, are around your hip mm -hmm. and one of the biggest consequences that happen after a fall is a fractured neck of femur a fractured hip and we know that a significant consequence of fracturing your hip is being in hospital, dying, or um, being institutionalized, so not living independently again. So one of the things that was suggested to try and prevent fractured hips um, after a fall or during a fall are these big cushions over your hips. 
Now, the trouble with those is they're not very attractive, um, they're not very comfortable. Um, only very recently have there been um, little windows on them which allow gentlemen to go to the toilet while wearing them. Um, and there is actually now very little evidence that um, they are any good at preventing fractured neck of femurs. So um, they're not generally recommended. We would, um, it was something um, that historically was, was prescribed a lot, wasn't it, um, that, that people would wear. But actually, we found in our profession that um, getting them on was far more risky yes. than actually the benefits of wearing them. Yeah. Are they difficult to get the, on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, because they are, you, you, you know, they're like, like you know, Bridget yes. Jones pants. Yes. You know, they're, they, they're, they're fit, they've got they're to be fitting. tight in order to be protected. They've, they've, so they're, they are rather fitted. So that might give you a lovely sort of streamlined um, <laughs> look um, but g but getting them on you know we know that people who are having difficulty and you know with falling as well you know with getting lower limb uh, clothing and footwear and things you know people do struggle so we would always you know recommend things like a long handled shoehorn and things like that, that stop you bending and, and and sort of tilting that center of gravity so so pulling them on was causing some issues that leads on nicely to uh, another question um, that someone um, well, quite a few people had asked about, they felt that one of the common situations where they felt they were about to fall was leaning down, down to plug yeah, sockets. Quite. Oh. What, 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 is there anything that can help? Well, um, plug sockets is a, is, a, is, a, is a different kettle of fish altogether. Um, and there are regulations, aren't they, about whereabouts, you know, how many uh, millimetres up from your, the floor or the skirting board a, a plug socket can, right, can go. Um, but obviously the most, the most sensible thing is to, is to have those put up higher. That's not something that, that um, you know, in our country we, we would cover. It would be a, it would be a private right. um, job that, you, you know, that, you, that you'd have done. So you could, so you c could raise your sockets um, or use um, varying extension cables, but of course then we're on the risk of trailing cables. Yeah. Um, so, so plug sockets, I would, the most obvious thing would be to get them higher up you know, okay. onto the wall. Um, but regarding general moving and leaning forward for any lower limb shoes, um, socks, underwear, there are different um, gadgets with, with long hands, long handled shoe horns, dressing sticks that we have that can help so that, so that you, would, you would be able to lean to one side, so keep, keeping your back straight, but you know, get, get your undergarments <laughs> on. <laughs> We're moving on to what will probably be our closing question and answer session, and it's a big question. What can we do, not just us, but the whole falls community, to educate people and society about falls? How can we get the government on board to change the way society is about falls? And what can we do to encourage or influence the way public and social spaces are structured to reduce the risk of falls? Uh, Massive question. question. <laughs> yeah, but I think, um, I think it's about encouraging active ageing. And um, you know, as the popula population gets older, in the past, it, that's always been perceived as a very negative consequence for society. Um, but I think we would prefer to look on it that actually that's a very positive um, thing for society and that there is a huge amount that our older um, uh, people can contribute to society mm -hmm. um, and keeping people healthy into their retirement or their old age is really important so encouraging people to remain active um, to um, keep independent as much as possible um, and that may be around diet um, giving people access to um, gyms swimming pools you know opportunities to keep active um, and social um, I think are all very important and, and I think um, another important thing that people might not realize is the power that that uh, the the baby boomers yeah this, this is a population at the moment um, which is in the middle and in the next 5, 10, 15 years they are going to be the biggest part of the population with the biggest numbers and are going to have huge voting power. Yeah. 
and younger people these days aren't voting, so they're going the proportion of um, that baby boomers who are voting are going to outweigh the younger people and have real influence over which political parties will support older people and services. And have considerable experience that they can bring. Um, so, you know, that's really important that, that um, older people realise what um, contribution that they continue mm -hmm. to have to society. It used to be that when you retired, you dropped off your perch and were never heard of again, but actually, um, you know, there is there is a massive contribution that the older population make. You know, you know, my parents look after my kids for me. Um, you know, and um, and you know, there's lots of things that people do in terms of contribution to taxes, contribution mm -hmm. to keeping um, younger people in work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Quite. Mm -hmm. My parents are the fourth emergency service, I believe. <laughs> um, and it is, and and you can feel you can feel through some of the comments and and people are saying, well, that's. That's great, but you know why aren't public buildings? Why why, why are we still looking at cinemas and, and and noting every risk factor you can imagine? Wide stairs, dark carpets, poor lighting, it, and it and you can feel this bubbling revolution. Yeah. Um, so so yes, sh let's shout about it. Yeah, um, and, and dispel this other myth that um, older people or retired people are a drain yeah. on. Um, public money, yeah. finances and resources, because that's been proven not to be true. Not to be true. Yeah. They um, contribute more to yes. the economy mm -hmm. than yeah. drain um, from the economy. And yeah. we know from, from research that's carried out in our region and, and across you know, the UK and you know, across the world, that it's that older population who are in there giving us the opinions, letting yeah. us know what's going on. So yeah, let's bring on, bring on the revolution. <laughs> I, th I, I think that's a nice positive note to finish, a, 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 a revolution. Um, so I'm sorry to anyone um, if we, who's posted a question that we didn't get round to answering. We, we, we went for those questions that came up more frequently um, so that we could try and answer uh, questions for the majority of people. But there is another chance. In, at the end of week four, we'll be having a, another live broadcast. You can post your questions at the end of week four. We'll send a link in an email so that you can go directly to that page. And our physiotherapist expert will be joining us then and we can get some more exercise questions answered for you there. And I really hope that you can join us or catch up with the videos later. So, but thanks for joining us today. Bye. Bye.